Welcome to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. Like any good marriage, we will debate, evaluate, and sometimes quarrel about how privacy and security impact business in the 21st century. Hi, Jody Daniels here. I'm the founder and CEO of Red Clover Advisors, a certified women's privacy consultancy. I'm a privacy consultant and certified informational privacy professional and provide practical privacy advice to overwhelmed companies. Hello, Justin Daniels here. I am passionate about helping companies solve complex cyber and privacy challenges during the life cycle of their business. I am the cyber quarterback helping clients design and implement cyber plans as well as help them manage and recover from data breaches. And this episode is brought to you by... Red Clover Advisors, we help companies to comply with data privacy laws and establish customer trust so that they can grow and nurture integrity. We work with companies in a variety of fields, including technology, e-commerce, professional services, and digital media. In short, we use data privacy to transform the way companies do business. Together, we're creating a future where there's greater trust between companies and consumers. To learn more and to check out our new Best-selling book, Data Reimagined, Building Trust, One Bite at a Time. Visit redcloveradvisors.com. You ready? I think so, but I have a question first. I guess we're in the middle of February. It's going to be, what, 70-some-odd degrees here today? 78 here in Atlanta. 78. So is this colorful shirt your ode to spring? You know, I think I've just decided we had so much fun the last time we were recording and I was bright and colorful. It was Valentine's Day. I thought I'm just going to make every recording day like Valentine's Day and bright and fun and purpley and pink. (laughs) Okay. It's very colorful. (laughs) All right. Well, I'm super excited for today because today we have Caitlin Fennessy, who is the vice president and chief knowledge officer at the International Association of Privacy Professionals, or in short, the IAPP where she guides the strategic development of IAPP research, publications, communications, programming, and external affairs. And prior to joining the IAPP, Caitlin was the Privacy Shield Director at the U.S. International Trade Administration, where she spent 10 years working on international privacy and cross-border data flow policy issues, which are still an issue today. And Caitlin, we're so excited that you are here today. Thank you so much uh, for having me. I, you know, I feel uh, not quite as fancy as as you since I'm wearing a gray dress, but uh, nonetheless, equally excited. That is okay. You know, Justin over here, he's in black and gray. So, you know, apparently I didn't get it's black and gray memo day. Well, you're the one dressing with flair. I try. You going to kick us off? I will. So, Caitlin. Give us a little primer on how your career evolved to where it is today. Thank you. Uh, we were we were chatting uh, before we kicked things off about how how long we've been in this field, and it is uh, somewhat daunting to say I've been in it almost fourteen years now. Uh, I jumped into privacy in uh, two thousand and nine, and certainly haven't looked back. And I, I was reflecting recently on on how I got into the field. I had been a public policy uh, major in grad school. I was interested in international relations and economics and trade. I was uh, very starry-eyed and wanted to do something meaningful. I absolutely think privacy, uh, you know, fit all of those interests. Although I have to say I didn't enter the field intentionally, which I think is the story most of us can tell. So I began uh, my career at the international, my career in privacy at the International Trade Administration, where I was applying for a trade policy focused job. And I met uh, the woman who hired me, who I I definitely credit for my career, Kristen Jensi. She is uh, still uh, at the International Trade Administration. She has been at the center of U.S. government policy on privacy uh, for quite some some time, and she directs their Office of Digital Services Industries. And when I met her, she sat me down, and I I still to this day picture uh, that scene from the movie in The Graduate, uh, where uh, I think his name was Mr. McGuire, 
uh, brings uh, Ben out as he's contemplating his, his life and his career and says, I have one word for you, plastics. And, and Kristen effectively sat me down and said, I have one word for you, privacy. And at the time in 2009, privacy was not taught. And I said to her, I, you know, I don't know anything about privacy. Can you help me understand? And she, she just said, you know, I promise you it will be big. And don't worry, the IEPP can teach you. <laughs> So right, right at the outset of uh, my career, I was thrown into IEPP training and, and conferences, and that was fun. I, I didn't join the IEPP for 10 years from that date, but Kristen was just so right about the, uh, the kind of takeoff of privacy policy. When I started at Commerce, I would write memos explaining to political leaders why what we did mattered, why we shouldn't be helping small businesses build websites, why we should help them uh, move data across the Atlantic. So I, I spent 10 years working on largely data transfer policy issues. Uh, ultimately, I uh, was the, the career staff lead during the Privacy Shield negotiations um, and uh, became the first Privacy Shield director, and it was it was really an incredible journey working on uh, privacy policy issues in Mexico with Canada in the APEC cross border privacy rules system, kind of around the world. Uh, before uh, leaving after about ten years to join uh, the IEPP, and uh, I was I was so excited. I had moved with uh, my family to New Hampshire. IEPP is here in New Hampshire and has really allowed me to take a step back from what uh, had been a very niche, some might say, focus on data transfer policy issues and, and look at the much broader context of privacy and how businesses and policymakers and governments are approaching uh, privacy uh, in in organizations around the world. So, so that's been fun, but that's my origin story. I love how you say that the IPP taught you everything and it was new to you. I kind of can't believe myself how long it's been. I was just counting and it was really 2011 where I was first learning about this whole privacy thing. And one of the very first places I went was IPP to go. Now I did join as a member uh, to learn everything that I needed to know. If we fast forward, privacy really is hot. It's cool. People are talking about it. It's made its stride. It's in the headlines. If you could help summarize what's happening in the privacy industry and how people keep up with all of it, what, what got us here, which is great for us because now privacy is cool. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I, I think so many of us that have worked in this space for a while, you know, start each year by saying, okay, this year really is crazier than, than the prior year. The, the amount of privacy issues that are coming at us really feels like it is increasing at an accelerating rate. Um, this year was absolutely no different. Um, but I, I see uh, a shift having taken place during the pandemic, where we went from privacy being something that governments and organizations were absolutely focused on for the past decade, at least, uh, to one that is a focus on Main Street. You know, now I get into a cab uh, in, you know, really any city in the world, and I don't have to explain what I do anymore. Uh, people uh, in, in all professions understand uh, why privacy matters. And I, I think that was in part a reflection of our lives and our livelihoods moving online during the pandemic. People realizing how important privacy was to their children's schooling, to their uh, engagement uh, in their jobs in a remote setting, uh, to their social engagement online. I mean, the fact that privacy is now being advertised during the Super Bowl, it is primetime television, it is giant billboards 
on the side of the highway. I mean, that has been a huge shift. Um, and and I, uh, I think that's exciting for, for all of us. It, it makes our ability to, to do our jobs and to talk about privacy uh, a whole lot easier. It's interesting that you say the, uh, the big billboards, you don't have to explain it anymore. I'll be in a small setting in a network environment, for example, meeting some people, you know, what do you do? What do you do? And inevitably, and just, I know it happens to you too. They always ask us all the questions and I'm always, well, but we have to hear about you too, but they just keep asking us all the questions. It's very interesting and intriguing to people. Yeah, I think it, it absolutely also highlights the fact that while people are aware of privacy now, we don't have to explain its importance, they still don't really understand how data protection works in practice, where you know personal data is going, how to protect it. So I, I think we have a long way to go, but at least we can have those conversations now a lot more easily without having to explain why it matters. I think part of the reason why privacy is being so become so cool is uh, it's been in the news because there have been some regulatory fines. We've seen some things under GDPR. Our friends at Sephora felt the wrath of our regulator in California. So from your perspective, as you closely watch the evolution of enforcement, um, what are the commonalities and takeaways you're seeing from the fines we've seen so far? Yeah, I, I really love that question because the the fines are so huge, right? We're we're talking about fines in the hundreds of millions uh, of dollars. Of course, uh, to some extent, they they pale in comparison to the FTC's, uh, you know, five billion dollar fine that that we saw some time ago. But I really don't think it is the size of the fines that matter um, at this stage. Um, one year ago, we, we make privacy predictions each uh, at the start of each year. And in January 2022, my prediction was that it was going to be the substance of uh, the privacy enforcement actions that lit up the headlines rather than their dollar values. And I, I think uh, I was maybe a little early on that uh, prediction because it was in January, but just barely January. 2023, where we saw the, the huge enforcement actions come out of uh, Ireland and the European Data Protection Board related to Meta. To my mind, that is the, the big shift we've seen, that we're seeing the conclusion of some of the more difficult uh, substantive cases. So we've moved from cases that focus on process failures to ones that really require companies to change their business practices. And ultimately that impacts the industry and all of us far more than the fine. So I think that's an important shift. And it, it doesn't really surprise me that that took some time. When the Federal Trade Commission uh, conducts investigations, those take quite a lot of time because they know that they need to be able to litigate them, have them stand up in court if they need to, even though in most cases they will settle those. And I think that's how uh, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner uh, approached uh, those cases. I, I think, uh, I guess if, if we go through beyond just the fact that they're they're more substantive, if we, we think about the issues they're raising, uh, I think Ad tech clearly is in for a reckoning on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, we're seeing that there's an increased focus on kids, on sensitive data and health. And of course, uh, data transfers is a perennial um, issue. And I, I guess the other thing that I think is, is noteworthy in the U.S. environment, besides the fact that California has, has entered the enforcement scene, which, which is its, its own huge thing, but the FTC has moved from cases largely under the uh, deception prong of their enforcement authority to uh, use of the unfairness prong, which is a higher bar. It's a bit more subjective um, and, and a bit more substantive. So it's not just what did you say and what did you promise consumers and are you 
uh, living up to those promises. They're also looking at was what you did fair or not and, and bringing cases in that lane. So that's a, a big shift I think we should all be paying attention to. What are you seeing from companies' response to those? Um, for example, you mentioned, right, the really big fundamental business shifts, the prediction from an ad tech and this unfair uh, principle that the FTC is looking at. How are you seeing companies respond? What are the kinds of questions you're hearing from them? Yeah, that's a it's a good question. I, I think maybe there's there's different answers to those. What I'll, I'll tease out is two questions. One is that companies are continuing to invest in their privacy teams. Um, they are still hiring uh, and, and growing. I think we saw a 12 percent increase um, in our latest uh, governance survey and report in the size of uh, privacy teams, which is is quite significant. So they they recognize uh, the increased risk landscape in privacy. And then what are they asking? They're asking for help keeping up. No doubt you both are hearing uh, the same thing. Uh, you know, countries around the world are either passing or have passed new laws for the first time, or they're updating uh, outdated laws. So, you know, whether it's uh, uh, PIPL in China, LGPD in Brazil, uh, the, the significant updates we expect to see to laws in Canada and Australia, or uh, simply the, uh, I guess not simply, but the host of new data related rules and regulations in the EU that go well beyond privacy, but certainly impact uh, companies' uh, privacy programs. Companies want help keeping up. They want really simple uh, kind of charts and comparisons to, to kick things off. They wanna understand what the commonalities, but perhaps more important, what the differences are between laws. Uh, the US state landscape, of course, is, is incredibly complex, generating lots of, of questions uh, for us. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the starting point. You know, From there, they're very focused on where the biggest risks uh, are. I think right now we're seeing a lot of attention to biometric data um, because of BIPA as well. Um, so, you know, trying to understand the, the major risks so that they can devote the greatest attention there is, is uh, increasingly important. Makes sense. It is common. That's what I hear as well. So one follow-up question I have for the two of you, because I was at a conference yesterday uh, about cyber insurance. <laughs> um, but one of the things we were talking about is, um, I don't see the federal government passing any kind of federal privacy legislation. It seems like we're on our way to having 50 state privacy laws, just like we have 50 state breach notification laws. And while that's good from a privacy professional standpoint, I wonder from an innovation and all of us as consumers, if that's a good thing. So I'd love to hear the two of you talk about that. Caitlin, I'll let you go first. Sure. Um, I, I, I mean, this one it, it continues to shock me. The fact that the U.S. is is almost alone among uh, major democratic governments in, in not having a federal privacy law, that alone seems shocking. Um, but last year, I, I, I'd say, you know, the U.S. got closer than ever before to adopting ADPPA. Uh, certainly closer than we'd ever seen in uh, 20 years. And it really felt like there was a confluence of events with the increase in uh, state privacy laws, the fact that five different states will have uh, those laws enter into effect this year and businesses pushing for a federal standard to get ahead of that. The advocates being very involved, the privacy advocates being very involved uh, in the drafting and very supportive of uh, the, the proposed bill. There seemed to be a compromise on, um, you know, private right of action and preemption that both Democrats and Republicans could, could live with. 
Um, and we saw, you know, in what they termed the three corners bill, both uh, the House and the Senate um, come together, the Republicans and the Democrats, uh, not Senator Cantwell, uh, who had concerns about uh, the, the enforcement provisions and, and uh, as well as some of the, the approach to preemption. This year, you know, obviously we we don't see that coalescing. Um, that being said, I was in DC just about a week ago, and there still is a lot of energy and optimism about moving forward on the House side. Um, Republicans and Democrats both still seemed interested in advancing uh, the ADPPA. Um, uh, on the Senate side, it was a, a little bit less clear, but everybody was talking to each other. It was clear that they were still working to uh, advance uh, privacy legislation. I think there's a, a bit of a discussion right now as to whether we'll see a standalone kids bill advance ahead of a federal privacy bill. And I, I would certainly bet on that. Um, and then the question is, does you know, is there only space for for one bill um, to advance uh, in in a given Congress on privacy? I I don't know. You know, I guess to your immediate question, it does feel like we're going to have a whole lot more state law before we see uh, a federal privacy law achieve success. I, the one caveat I would put there is if we did see a state pass a law with a private right of action, I think we would see Congress at the federal level jump in pretty fast uh, to, to advance a, five, uh, a federal bill that would preempt that. And interestingly, here in New Hampshire, uh, there is a bill that has a lot of support. Um, and the state AG's uh, main criticism of the bill um, uh, was that it didn't include a private right of action. So I, I found that intriguing. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on the landscape. So mine is, I don't think we're going to see a federal bill anytime soon, unless it's just from a political standpoint. I call it throwing a political dart at a crystal ball. You just have no idea on any issue. I feel like someone just magically will maybe make that happen. But I do think, Caitlin, I agree with you. If one were to move, I think it would be a kid's bill. And quite honestly, as a parent of kids, I would like to see that. I think most people can agree we should protect kids. It seems like the argument is the age. I, I could see that one. Even if a national bill moved forward, though, I don't think that precludes, obviously, it depends on which direction, if it would be a ceiling or a floor, you know, what the states would do. If we look at what happened with GDPR, that's the floor. You still have member states that have interpretations and even some local laws that are still on top of that. So it didn't really create, that's it. You still have other interpretations. Google Analytics is like, okay in some countries, not okay in other countries. Cookie banners need to be this way, but not that way. You have to keep records this way, but not that way, right? There's still local interpretations. And I could see the same thing happening here in the state. So it might move us forward in some ways, but. I'm not sure it's the panacea for everything. That's my view. Okay, we're going to hold you both to that, and we're going to replay see, this. My, we'll see how well my crystal dart is. I'm, Caitlin does this every year. I think she has slightly more experience with her prediction. <laughs> I'm going to go with Caitlin's vote. Maybe, maybe. Mm. I would like to see a kid's bill, if nothing else. I'd like, I'd like to see that. I wonder if the upcoming Supreme Court cases on Section 230 of the Telecom Act having implications for privacy, or is that a little bit really in a different area? I guess we'll just have to see. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about that this morning while I, I listened to some podcasts analyzing them. Um, obviously, those issues uh, always intersect around free speech and the like. But um, yeah, that will be an interesting one to watch. So, in addition to our discussion with crystal darts and laws, crystal darts. we now have to deal with new technologies and their implications for privacy, because I can't think of any new technology that doesn't have implications from privacies. So, let's talk about AI with ChatGPT. That's all been the rage lately. And so, love to get your thoughts about the risks that you see around AI and privacy and what the role of the privacy industry and IAPP is in the education 
so that people can understand these issues better when it comes to AI? Yeah, thank you. This is one that I am particularly interested in. So I'm uh, really excited to talk about some of the work uh, that our team is, is doing here. Um, I, I expect uh, many, many of those of you listening like me have been quite intrigued by the, the conversations with the new Bing or Sydney uh, that, that we've been reading about. Um, it, you know, I, I think what it highlights is simply that we, we all need to be thinking about this very, very quickly, um, like so many organizations already are. And, and clearly, um, those rolling out these major AI uh, initiatives have given this a lot of thought, have put in place some important guardrails and guidelines and responsible AI principles. Uh, what we've been doing in the space is, is trying to understand not only what uh, organizations are doing to approach uh, responsible AI governance, but who's doing the work. So at the, at the beginning of this year, we rolled out uh, our first major AI report, Privacy and AI Governance based on uh, interviews with AI governance leaders um, in a number of, of discrete sectors. And I, I found the, the results quite striking. We found that more than 50% of organizations building uh, new AI governance approaches uh, and responsible AI governance were doing it on top of mature privacy programs. And I think anecdotally, we knew that privacy professionals were kind of the, the first folks brought to the table within organizations to figure this out because a lot of the privacy principles with which we are so familiar uh, underpin what is, is becoming uh, commonly accepted AI governance principles. And so since there, there weren't uh, AI governance uh, uh, teams existing in organizations, they naturally went to their, their privacy professionals and, and asked them to lead on this work. Um, we, we also saw that in 80% of the cases where organizations published responsible AI guidelines, uh, the legal privacy uh, role had played a major role in crafting or a leading role in formulating those principles. Um, another interesting bit of uh, kind of statistics or findings were that 40% of those uh, leaders we spoke to uh, were building algorithmic impact assessments on top of privacy or data protection impact assessments. So privacy professionals are at the forefront of this field. I, I think we all recognize that AI governance requires um, uh, more than, than uh, the, the principles that we are all familiar with and, and different um, understandings and appreciations of those principles, transparency uh, and explainability mean something different uh, in the AI context. There is much uh, more uh, focus on bias avoidance and, and you know, the, the genesis of these large data sets for training uh, data and the like. Um, and, and so I think we're all trying to work this out. What, what I'm really excited about now that we have just rolled out, and I'll say we, we would love any of your listeners' insights, uh, we have launched our first AI uh, survey in partnership with Ohio State University. Uh, so it's not only our first uh, survey-based AI research, it is um, our first partnership with an academic institution. They are leading on the, the analysis um, uh, of uh, our findings here, but basically so we can understand uh, in practice how organizations are approaching AI governance at a much more granular level. And I guess I'll, I'll take a step back and say, you know, we could we could ask, we could debate, you know, is AI governance really a privacy issue? You know, clearly privacy is a, a component, but is this a privacy issue? And ultimately, from our perspective, we don't 
really think it matters because privacy professionals are being asked to do the work. So here at IAPP, you know, we see our role as helping them uh, to, to figure this out. You're looking at me strangely. I know you have so many ideas perking in your head. Hmm. I have many. I'll just be interested see? to see. Well, I knew that. Well, I guess mind reader. Mind reader. It's called being married to the same person <laughs> for 15 years now. But I guess Caitlin is a follow up on that interesting topic. Um, you know, in in the work that I do, I really hit the intersection between, as I call it, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich of technology of privacy and security. And so uh, it, when I think about AI tools that are now being deployed for human resources, can you imagine, you know, having the AI be the one to identify whether or not you're going to even get the, uh, the interview with a person? So then you get into issues around um, anonymizing data because resumes obviously contain personal information. But at the same time, from a security perspective, Hackers are really smart. If they can reverse engineer that anonymized data and now it's not anymore and we're talking about stuff on a resume, that's a real issue. And so I'm interested just from my own perspective as you develop these tools with IAPP and privacy, how much does security play a role in how you develop those materials? Because the two, while not the same, are so interrelated when it comes to AI. Oh, I, absolutely. I, you know, I think for quite some time, we've, we've been quite clear uh, that you can't do privacy without security and, and vice versa. Um, and I think when it comes to uh, emerging technologies and AI in particular, the security challenges and the privacy challenges are only heightened. Um, we do look at AI and uh, privacy enhancing technologies and, and emerging tech in general as presenting an opportunity for the two fields to come together to a greater extent than they did in the past. As, as you both know, privacy largely grew up in the legal realm. Uh, there was, uh, you know, then kind of a pivot to uh, compliance management and the everyone involved in operationalizing uh, privacy program management. Now I think we're seeing the field become more technical. A lot of those technical professionals have been more involved in the security uh, uh, profession. And so I, I think we're seeing some exciting intersections that I tend to think will, will only strengthen um, our field, and particularly when technologists can talk to the lawyers can talk to privacy program managers uh, with a greater understanding of what uh, role each of them play in um, protecting this data. Well, I will look forward to that report alongside the many other amazing IAPP research and reports that you have out there. And uh, with so much privacy knowledge, I'd love if you could share your best privacy tip you might offer your friends at a party. And also, we're going to change up this last, we always ask everyone this question, but also because you have so many amazing IAPP materials, is there one that, you know, you, you love not more than another, you might love them all equally, but <laughs> that you really feel like a member should bookmark on their page? You're asking me which of my my children is my favorite. That's, that's I I I know. That's why I just <laughs> went with like the the bookmark option. So not totally favorite. Just really good information that you want to go back to all the time. Yeah. So on um, on that question, I I have to say um, the state privacy tracker that our our team runs. Um, is probably uh, right up there uh, among my favorites because I, I think it, it it provides useful data to people doing so many different things. You know, those of us who who really like uh, tracking um, policy and, and political developments and understanding uh, uh, the the diplomacy and, and politics and substance of those debates. 
you know, Joe Dubal uh, is, is covering this like a major sporting event and helping us to, to track the progress of the state uh, legislation. Then those on the more operational side saying, oh my God, five uh, state privacy laws are, are now in effect. How do they line up? What are the commonalities? What are the differences? Where do I need to zero in? Can, can look at that chart and, and compare across the different substantive provisions and understand which both laws and legislation um, uh, you know, cover each of those substantive elements. And, and for that, we have uh, Enoki Desai, one of this year's Weston Fellows, uh, to thank, but but many Weston Fellows along the way for, for helping us manage that. So I, I would say um, that is my favorite. Uh, in terms of uh, party tips, you know, um, uh, you know, those are, are typically more, more personal in terms of, you know, not targeted at organizations, but really how can individuals protect their privacy? I'd say, you know, top three tips, maybe think before you share information. Uh, to my mind, that's the first thing that all privacy professionals learn is uh, not to overshare that just because someone asks you for personal information doesn't mean you need uh, to supply it. Um, to understand who you're sharing it with, uh, that is increasingly difficult, of course, given the supply chains of data management, but having some understanding of whether you trust the entity uh, I, I think is the, the first party is huge. Trust is definitely the, the new currency. And then maybe my third tip is simply explain privacy to your children. Um, we've talked about uh, we've talked about the kids' bills floating through, but whether it's parents or, or teachers or friends, making sure that children have some appreciation and understanding. Uh, for privacy and, and the uh, the risks of oversharing their personal information, I think is going to be huge. Well, our youngest child will often say, mom, don't share that information. You don't need to share that with them. Uh, so yes, we're, we're certainly doing that. And I have to say, as a visual person, I love the state trackers, but I really love the state maps. So yay to the state map makers. We, we will give kudos to our, uh, our layout team. Uh, They're awesome. Doing amazing work there. Why is it funny? I don't know. I think I've learned from this tip that in privacy, sharing does not necessarily mean caring. Mm, yes. <laughs> so when you're not reading, speaking, and writing all things privacy, what do you like to do for fun? Oh, that's a fun one. Thank you. Um, I'm a I'm a big runner, actually. Um, and uh, one of the cool things about privacy is it turns out that there are a whole lot of runners in privacy. So every time I go to an IEPP conference just about anywhere around the world, I can find uh, some runners to to join me on an early morning run and that's been a lot of fun. Great way to get to know people. Um, other than that, I, I spend most of my spare time watching my three young boys play sports. So I enjoy that as well. Professional chauffeur. Yes. yes. Yep. We can imagine that will keep you busy for quite some time. Well, Caitlin, we have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Where can people uh, connect and learn more? Thank you. Um, you know, the, the top tip that I always give to anyone uh, just starting out in privacy is start by subscribing to IAPP's daily dashboard, uh, our daily newsletter of all things privacy. It's basically the top 10 things that happen that day in privacy that you should know about. Um, and you actually don't have to be a member to subscribe. It is free and open to all. So Highly recommend that, particularly for students. Um, uh, other than that, I recommend they visit our resource center. I think our resource center uh, is uh, underutilized and we're doing a lot of work uh, to make the information and resources we put out there more uh, findable. But as it is, you can go and select your region or country or topic, whether it's AI or biometrics or state privacy, 
what's happening in China, um, what's happening um, uh, with kids data, our ad tech, and, and dive in deeper to those topics. Um, uh, you know, those familiar with the IEPP will also know you can find your local knowledge net in your city um, and attend their meetings, a great way to network and learn about uh, topics. Uh, if you have the time and inclination, uh, join us at one of our, our conferences. We have our Global Privacy Summit coming up uh, in D.C. at the beginning of April and for those, and I suspect a lot of your listeners are in this bucket who have been in privacy for quite some time, I always like to encourage people to volunteer with us on our boards. Our advisory boards help us program our conferences, help us um, consider our topics for research or publications, help formulate our certifications. So that's a great way to get involved. And then always welcome submissions of articles uh, to our publications, and you can reach over 75,000 uh, privacy professionals globally with your thoughts on privacy. So please share them uh, with us and uh, feel free to reach out if, if you want more information on any of that. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you both. It's been a pleasure speaking. Thanks for listening to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check us out on LinkedIn. See you next time.